The amazing thing about uh, in the Old Testament, First and Second Kings, is that it's got a 400-year recital of the kings of the David family in Jerusalem, and right in the middle of it are 10 chapters, that's about 20% of the whole, 10 chapters about Elisha. So he interrupts the royal timeline in the narrative, and uh, he is uncredentialed, he has no pedigree, he has no claim to authority, and what the narrative shows is that he has this uh, incredible capacity to enact transformation. <laughs> In many of these narratives, the king, because this is first and second kings, the king appears in the narrative, and every time the king is impotent and irrelevant to the narrative. So I think those narratives about Elisha are incredibly subversive, uh, because what they say, do not look for the power of life in the structures of the empire but look for power of life around the edges in the neighborhood among uncredentialed people. And that's where health comes. So that's how I read that narrative. Cool. I mean, and then just, I guess, one last thing for both of you. What, what, uh, what stirs your imagination and what gives you hope? What stirs my imagination uh, is being with Peter. Because I'll go home now and uh, Peter has uh, s streamed out all this stuff that I have to think about a lot longer. <laughs> and uh, funny. Peter has uh, lots of narrative reports on uh, precincts of hope. So my answer is the same, you know, being around you and Walter uh, fuels me, it enlivens me, it ignites me, because you've given me uh, a ground and a storyline that I was missing. <clears throat> And a legitimacy that I was missing, and and more than that, what fuels my imagination is a thought. So I love Walter and, and uh, John and others because they value the power of a thought. And in this culture, we're terrified of thought. Uh, we are more interested in resume than thinking. That's right. And uh, and so when I'm around because it changes my thinking, deepens my thinking. Yep. Now the question of hope, though, I want to, I don't use that word, because hope implies awaiting. And it's a modernist idea that innovation leads to progress. And so the question we get asked all the time is, what's next? What's new? And the answer is nothing. And I don't want to wait. And I don't want to, people, you know, hope and optimism are really ways of saying, well, what do you think of the future? Is it going to get better? So the wish to predict the future is really a wish to control the future. And so I would substitute faith for hope. I have infinite amount of faith. Uh, none of it based on evidence. Or maybe one thing happened 20 years ago that I... And so what sustains my faith is the experience of being with the yeah. thought. Yeah. Uh, what sustains my faith is your listening. So you made a pilgrimage to come to be with Walter and I, which then makes me realize that the things that we are typing and talking about, uh, there's a listening for them, so that I have faith that my life is meaning something.
and I need that. Yeah. Uh, but to me, it's more faith than hope. Or are you optimistic? People think I'm a cynic. They think I'm pessimistic. Not sure. I just I'm not interested. In, and do I see signs of progress in the 73 years I've been alive? It's really ambiguous. I can I can I can you can I'll go either way. I'm revising a book I wrote, which a friend says that to revise a book you wrote 20 years ago is like taking a picture of yourself when you were 40 and touching it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's but good. I do it because I do it. And uh, I'm going to make a list of here's what's changed in the last 20 years. And then a long list of here's what hasn't changed in 20 years. Mm -hmm. and the conversations we're having, anybody who claims victory or things are better now, better off, that conversation is a defense against the grief cry that Walter talks about. So I would never argue with it, but I would say, why are we spending time talking about whether things are getting better or not? I don't need that reassurance. It's not useful to me because it breeds complacency. It, it breeds a premature celebration, premature victory. And so, and, and you know, impact, I want to have leverage. The millennials, what are they up to? The X's and Y's. It's all marketing talk. I'm not interested in it really. And what impact did we have? It's been pathetic. You know, people <laughs> say, oh, you've, you've done this and this and this. I know I have. How pathetic is that? How pathetic. So the victory, you know, upbeat, new age, the age of the new millennium. I think the millennium didn't start well. <laughs> we all thought, you know, uh, we thought the world was going to collapse because the computers couldn't honor the new millennium. Right, they right. couldn't go from one to two on the left hand of a number. And so Kathy convinced me we should buy enough champagne so if everything shuts down, we'll have uh, enough on New Year's Eve. Let's get it before the... I'm still trying to drink those bottles. <laughs> Got it? So the idea, the, the Vision 2020, all that conversation to me, is taking uh, space from the real work of the grief, tragic sense of life, aliveness, the prophecy, discovering the voices of Elijah in each other, the uncredentialed authorization, the ignorant perfection of ordinary people. That, that gives me energy, that keeps yep. my blood flowing. And, and, and I know when I'm in that presence, and that presence is what Walter gives voice to, that he is He's uh, modernized in a positive way, the prophetic voice, uh, by becoming that. And it, that's given me a sense of purpose I didn't have before. I was, there's, a, there's a false humility in all of us. And you say, well, I'm going to be as strong a voice as I can be, and knowing it's a pathetic uh, adventure. It's just, just, there's too much suffering in the world to, to feel proud. You, know? you can be grateful, but you can't be proud. Can I? Just one, because it was, it's the ending note, it was a relational one, right? And I know. friendship. Always. So your friendship, yet friendship is so often seen uh, by pragmatists, and our world is pragmatic, as, okay, we got the relationship part over, now what did we get done, right? Yet right, great the point. relationship is it's the, the thing. End. That's right. It's the community that's built. Yet we see relationship as a means to an end, which yep. is yep. eradicating poverty or building more houses or something. Yep. And for you guys to end this conversation, kind of acknowledging that my friendship to you is, and that's like the soil of life that's and right. aliveness. That's right. Yet it's so. When we talk about friendship to churches, even it's always seen as instrumental. All right, it's, yeah. it's a you know. mixture of instrumental and it's a benefit package. Yeah. It's not the point. Yeah. So I think the friendship with Walter is, if I was looking for evidence that miracles do exist in the world, it's enough. <laughs> <laughs> that to have found and been found by Walter is a miracle, and I never forget that. And to me, friendship is the point. There's a, a guy, Jim Keane, who's a city manager, he says the reason problems exist in the world is they give us an excuse to get together. <laughs> <laughs> Wendell Berry recently used the 
the phrase, what we need is an affective economics. Mm. Awesome. That's emotively uh, mm. mounted. See, that thought, I'm good for a week or a month. Yep, yep. Just that thought. That, yep. that language, that's the power of language. Yep, there. that's right. So an affective, he took affect, affection, and married it with economics. That's our work then. So what I'd want from the faith community is to take that one thought and write it for a year. Because the beauty of the faith committee community is you've value ideas. It is a committee, by the way, it's not a community. It is a committee. <laughs> the value of the faith community is that you value ideas, you're organized around an idea. Right. That's right. Where the uh, private sector, the business community, you know, the, is indifferent to ideas. They're agnostic to ideas. That's right. They want to know what works. You know? And so our answer to that is nothing works. <laughs> Wrong question. How much does it cost? Wrong question. Cost you your life, you interest. The Shackleton, the guy who, had, who explored South Antarctica, put an ad in the London paper. He says, I need people to go on a trip. And he, he says, uh, low pay, horrible working conditions, safe return, doubtful. You interested? <laughs> okay. 5,000 people answered this ad. Really? Ha, 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 ha,